Yo, 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 yo. This episode, I got a lot to say. Hey loves, it's A back on your screen with another one. I hope you're all well. As the title tells, today we're discussing Atlanta season one, episode three, Go For Broke. Perfect title because from scene one to end credits, it's giving broke boy energy. Earn is not just a waste man, he's a waste man with potential, which is, I would argue, one of the worst waste men. It's better if you meet a dude like this, if you're on the dating scene, and they have no potential because you don't pay them any mind. Let them go figure out their lives. Or if you want to be that girl, if you like it, I love it. Help them along the way. Or if you want to stay down with them. But I always think in a relationship, you should want to level up. You don't force someone to change or mold them to be what you want them to be. But there's this intentionality that you're growing and going forward, whatever path life might take you. I wanted to mention that because I think that is part of the theme of this episode as we see the conversation, the discourse, and the relationship of Van and Ern expressed more. But before I get into that, let's start from the very first scene. Opening scene is Ern. Can I get a happy meal? Can I get a kid's meal? <laughs> he whispers it three times for dramatic effect, and I'm getting third hand embarrassment, okay? This show never ceases to fail at making real life situations not just relatable but somewhat shameful and sometimes funny this moment is only funny in the latter part of the scene but the first part is giving me heavy cringe vibes as he's going back and forth with the day manager i don't know if she's on some next level ish or she's just very very serious about her job but she ain't with it he's saying oh do i need to bring a child with me she's saying yes and it just seems like such an unnecessary conversation one could discuss and debate that the customer is always right and he could have a kid in the car picking them up from school or know that he is the kid and given the meal but the principle is it's for kids 14 and under it's just funny in the service industry you don't see people put their foot down that much so i don't know which side i sit with that you can let me know if it really is good on her as a day manager to be like nah i know what you're trying to do people like you come in all the time or just trying to shame him or she's just standing up for the policies and rules of her job he asked for a cup for some water slides a little to the right and instead of filling it up with water fills with sprite and of course he looks to the side and to be even more shameful sees a woman mopping the floor finger to his lips walks away slowly and that was a little bit of comedic relief but on second watch six years later I feel cringe. I just, it's giving me the ick. And I think the reason why is knowing that there's a difference between being broke and poor. From the looks of it, Donald Glover's character, Earn, is broke. Broke for me is some part your environment and things out of your doing, but also habits and traits and personality characteristics that lend to you staying broke. Poor is when you can't get out of it. It's not your choice, not your willing, not your doing. Maybe you're efforting, but you're still there. I think there's a clear desertion. So we're going to focus on broke in this episode. I don't want to offend anyone who is poor and can't get up because society has made it that way that there's a certain amount of people on the planet that will be poor because that's what supports and fuels capitalism. We could talk about that for days. We're not going to do that in this episode today though. So when we look at brokenness as it is on the outset, it is the idea that he's going to get a kid's meal because he can't afford a proper one. He's going to steal pop because he probably needs that sugar rush because he's not getting enough nutrients. Don't let me get on my nutrition girl tip. You guys know I went to school for it. But what's most disheartening about the scene is that he's a grown man working and not making enough money to eat. That is where society fails. There is no point on the Western Hemisphere where a person who works 40 hours a week should not have enough money to eat. Now, if he is broke in the mindset where he's spending money on other things that are frivolous or not as important as health, then okay. But if it's because the rent is too high, the food is too high, what kind of life is that, right? Don't let me go off on that because I could go for days. That's what that scene symbolized for me. Moving on to the next scene, he goes over to Paperboy and Darius's house Seems like Darius is ironing money. I hope I saw that wrong, because that's super weird. And he says something about there's a bullet in it, and I don't know what that was about, because I couldn't see that far. Maybe six years ago, I could tell. 
suspicions gotten worse. So let me know down below what happened with that. They're basically discussing how hard it is to come up and then earn ass paperboy and he's completely rude with it. Al is like, I get it how I live it. How else would I pay for the video shoots, the studio time, the outfits, all of the image that goes into the illusion of a rapper comes with living that lifestyle. He's about that life. And I laugh at it because again, it leads to this broke mindset, this broke mentality where if you're in these circumstances, what do you do? Are you trying to go the earnest way, literally earn working at the airport and struggling or you're about that life like Paperboy. So he gets back home, elapsed time, who knows, all day. All I do know is Van is not having it. She's like, what were you up to all day? You couldn't get Lottie? And he's like, I thought you got it. And now we have this dialogue exchange where we can see that it's weighing heavily on Van that she's basically a single mom to Lottie. Earn might be living in the house, but I don't think he's contributing because he made a joke about being homeless but being in bed. And there's this discussion about just Van feeling like a crazy woman when she speaks to him about things. And again, this really does tether into the last episode of season three. The signs were there all along. There's so much in this scene. We find out that Ern doesn't pick up Lottie, that Van usually drops Lottie off to his parents' house. That's the least he could do, no? There's a lot of women who live this life. They may have a man in the household, but they're the sole caregiver for the child. I don't think that's right. I don't know what's worse, being a single mom and the man not being there or not being in the household or him being around, but just thinking you got it and it's okay. I, I don't wish that on anybody. I definitely don't want that life. I'm not about struggle love. I'm not here for it. I just, this episode pained me for every single character, every single character. It wasn't as funny as some of the ones to come, but I think it had its place in time and it actually stands the test of time. In bed, they're talking, Ern expresses that he does love Van and he also says, you know, I wanna take you out. She's not about it. He says, I'll take you out. I'll even eat across the room or watch you eat or whatever it is. And you can go out with this corny dudes with the dreads and the buns. This is also equally cringe because you're not showing up as a man and now you're mocking the fact that she's trying to find another man in her life. And then you're still trying to kind of tether being there. I'm not here for it. But she agrees, he falls asleep, wakes up, she's gone because that's the cycle. She has to always be on her ones and twos. Ern opens his bank app. He ain't got it like that. He calls up a friend and they're talking back and forth, asking for suggestions. The end of this scene got me when the man's like, why are you listening to my conversations? Don't tell me you never had a moment like that. You're in a confined space. You're doing your best not to listen. You're minding your own business or popping in your AirPods or whatever you need to do. And the person next to you is like, you shouldn't have been listening. It's like, I was trying not to. Where could I have gone? So I was laughing at that moment because I'm like, that was definitely for the culture. <laughs> Van and Ern, they're driving and they're talking about things and then they get to a place and she's like, this is not valet. And he's like, it's okay. I think he saves $4 parking with the sketchy guy. Just everything about this is not right. Thank God he listens to Van's discernment after she urges him, we're not parking here, let's go to valet. He's trying to penny pinch every bit along the way. Life is expensive as soon as you leave the door. You've seen those TikToks, I'm sure. So they get to the restaurant. The first thing he says is, can I get the happy hour special? The server's like, we don't have that. And as soon as she says that, she starts explaining more about the hands being changed over, different management. He's not listening to that. You can see from his facial expressions, his heart is being digested from his stomach because that's all he can afford to eat at this point. I don't know if Van doesn't know or she doesn't care because she hasn't been on a date in a minute. She starts to talk about the wine versus the drink. She gets the cocktail. Then they're talking about apps and he says, I'll get a water. And then she's like, I can't drink alone, which I feel the exact same way. <laughs> so he asks for a Miller high something. I don't know. It's one of those tall cans. The server is so shady saying he's a hipster. It's just so bad. And then she starts doing add-ons. I worked in the restaurant for a very long time, never as a server, but the servers would tell me they really do run game on people. They would be like, oh, seat me that table. Don't seat me. They would really size people up. I don't agree with that. Don't judge because you never know who's got it and who doesn't. Plus, you should be giving good service to everyone. That's a side note. But I say that to say a lot of times when servers see a date night, they will try to upsize because usually the man is trying to impress or the woman is going to finesse. And especially if you see the ways of the world with social media today, everyone's trying to glow up for the gram. So it's always an instant moment of snapping this dish or ordering an extra glass of this. So it's funny seeing back then when Instagram was 
about four or five years old. They weren't really taking pictures like that, but it's still that kind of energy of we're out. We haven't been out. Let me schmooze and get as much out of this table as I can. How much can I sell? What can I pair well with? At the end of the dinner, Ern's like, stop it. She tries to upsell him on her dessert. You've been killing me. And she just gives him the bill. But before that point, Fan starts talking about her day and work. And he's not interested at all. He says one moment he goes up to the bar and he's like, can you just tell me what my tab is? Because I ordered something at market value. <laughs> not the bartender being like, you're broke. And that goes to show that there are these societal norms out there where maybe someone won't go up to the bartender and necessarily ask what the bill is at. But there is that connotation when you go out, that idea that certain amount of money needs to be spent under certain circumstances. And there's a lot of pressure out there. I feel like that's a kind of dating conversation we can table for another day or discuss more on the Patreon pod. Now they're getting into the conversation. I guess Ern's loosened up a bit and they start talking about failure. And I thought this part was so beautiful. This is why I love Atlanta. In the mix of all the strange and weird and unsensible things, there's something so grounding and beautiful about talking about topics like this, the idea that you need to fail in order to succeed, that that is a part of life and it is the natural cycle of things. And seeing very human characters go through very realistic setups. At the end, he goes to call Paperboy up to ask for a 20. <laughs> we'll get into that conversation when we go into the Paperboy plot line, but I thought that was so hilarious. And then Van, why does she have to call out that the card got declined two times? Was that really necessary? She checks the bill fold and sees that he didn't tip. She makes a comment about it's bad enough that she gets paid less as a woman. My brain didn't go there. Again, because I worked in the restaurant industry, servers get paid less, at least in Ontario, than minimum wage. It's assumed that since you're making tips, it's gonna make up for it. So they pay you less than minimum wage. I always thought that was strange. I was thinking from that mindset, you got a tipper because a lot of times they have to pay the house. So each table is 5%. You have to pay the manager, the hostess, the bartender, sometimes the kitchen staff, which probably is the one that should be paid the most that gets paid the least. A lot of times when you're tipping, it's not just the money the server can keep. And if you don't tip, they actually have to pay for your table. It was interesting that she was gatekeeping that situation she has to know he doesn't have it but luckily she did tip or maybe she added more when they get home they're obviously picking up discussing whatever's going on with Ern trying to take over and help al blow up and van is not really here for it and i can understand why if you watch this show and it's your first time watching it you don't know where they're gonna end up and it just seems like a pipe dream and that's what she's saying and he throws it back at her so is owning a fashion boutique and she slams the door on him. I didn't realize Van wanted to own a fashion boutique. The thing that's so funny about this is when you look at fashion boutique or up and coming rapper, they're both pipe dreams. They're both things that someone has done a million times before and failed. So who's to say you will succeed or who's to say you won't? But you won't know until you try. And I think the conversation there really is deep rooted in this idea of believing in yourself, having perseverance, Consistency is not key. I hate when people see that. You can be consistent for a decade and things won't pan out. You need opportunity. You need luck. And sometimes you need to do things a little shady. I've realized that. I don't know if I'm willing to compensate that for my dreams and goals, but it's seeming a lot like the people that get where they want to go have to cut corners. Let me know if you agree with me, but that's how I'm seeing the world these days, especially when I get antidotes from people I know. This scene really stood out to me when Van slams a door in his face. Ern thinks he's really doing something with that soliloquy about having to try and not compensating himself for his dreams. And the entire time he's saying it, I'm like, bah, 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 bah. I mean, I get what he's saying, but at the same time, we have to look at it from both sides. Van's already compensated her dreams. She's already taking more care of Lottie than he is. And it just seems like she's really worn out. So it's so in sensitive and disingenuous to be saying these things on the other side of the wall knowing that person already sacrificed all of that for the family that she wants to have with you and that's why it falls a little short it's not that what he said wasn't right it's more that you have to see it from both sides and i think in a relationship a lot of times we're looking at what we want instead of what we can give to the next person or how we can build together those are my thoughts at least. He goes outside with a big bottle, swigs it up, and makes me think of the same thing that his mom did when we watched Lottie in the last episode. How do you finish a whole bottle watching your granddaughter? 
And then he calls up the credit card or debit company to report fraud. And I say, Wasteman energy level high. Now let's go back. We're going to talk about the Paperboy plot line real quick because I thought this was funny as some moments I was like, this is slapstick. I can't. But some moments I was just howling at the screen like I can't believe I forgot about this. Al and Darius are in a car. They're supposed to meet. But then the person says drive. They go on a windy woods street. It's giving super sketchy. They end up at a trailer and there is offset takeoff and Quavo. And I love this scene because it's giving omniscient, but it's also giving comedy. Just before they get out of the car, Darius is like, I handcuffed the suitcase to me. This is giving real movie D's. I know they were trying to be funny with this moment, but it just didn't land for me. When Darius is fumbling with the handcuff on the suitcase and asks Paperboy, did you take the key off the table? I'm just like, this is, Darius is too complex of a character to be this aloof, okay? Or aloft or whatever the word is. But it gets funny later on when they go to meet Migos and they get this very omniscient vibe. This scene really teethers between being super scary and super silly every 15, 20 seconds. So they go to sit down. Darius is trying to be as inconspicuous as possible, but it's so obvious that he handcuffed himself to the suitcase like Aedia. This is not a movie, sir. What are you doing? Al is telling him to calm down because I'm sure he's getting more anxious in the presence of someone who's anxious. And everyone's just trying to feel each other out. This scene is giving very masculine energy where everyone's trying to figure out what their intentions are, where this is going to go. Next thing you know, they open up the bottom flap of the trailer and a man in his boxers falls out. If I didn't see the show before, I'd be like, what the hell is going on? But I started to laugh because I started to remember what was going to happen next. So the next thing we know, they tell him to go put on his clothes. They tell him to run in the woods. This is giving prey type of tease as they hit a warning shot and they shoot him the next. And I'm just like, what message are you really trying to send Al and Darius? They tell him to enter in the trailer and now they're shaking in their boots that's when Quavo or Offset whichever one is asking him weren't you the rapper you went to jail but not for a long time and they're kind of feeling out each other's energy the phone is vibrating for a really long time paperboard doesn't want to answer that Quavo says answered on speakerphone <laughs> and as I said before he's asking to spot him at 20 why does he go on to talk about, oh, you're going to meet those Mexicans you're not scared about with the guns, right? Yeah, but they're shaking in their boots. He's like, bye, bye, bye. He hangs up on them. Then the Mexican comes in. I'm going to assume that he's Mexican because they said he was Mexican, but it was somebody else. And they're like, who's that? And that's, that's my cousin. He's like, oh, paper boy, I love you. They're dapsing, chopping it up. The, the big dilemma is now that Darius finally admits well, we have a little problem because I am secured to the suitcase. Quavo says in a very scary voice, we can handle that. Now I'm thinking, what do you mean you gonna handle that? By the time they're leaving the trailer, the suitcase is still attached to Darius and Quavo or Offset, whichever one says, see, you get to keep the suitcase and we get the money. And I'm like, this is so stupid. Just when they're walking away, Paperboy looks back and says, what was your name of the group again? And they say the Migos and they go like this. And it just gives me nostalgia. Just remembering that that was the precipice. That's when the Migos were the Migos. Cause as you guys know, or may not know, the Migos is no more for now. I'm sure in a year or two, they'll come back, but it's now Unconfew and Offset and Cardi B. And I mean, two different duos over there, so. Life changes. It's just funny looking back and seeing what's changed and what hasn't changed and what parts of the storyline still pertain to present day. As we're in a panorama, I just keep thinking the under the undercurrent of go for broke really stands the test of time. How there's gonna be a lot of people that have to make unsavory decisions based on their conditions and other people who are gonna have to sacrifice health and wellness in order to survive, forget, thrive. And it's just... You know, I would really hope in the last six years since this episode filmed, less people are going through this or people who are maybe in that situation back then are doing better than before. Who knows? I can just wish well and hope that people are educating themselves the best as possible to try to overcome. But knowing that in some circumstances, no amount of education can help. It's a structure. 
the system is at play society is broken and it works this way to benefit and we've talked about this in other episodes about capitalism so there's so much dense conversation here about capitalism about relationship about how money really does impact every area of your life i hate when people say money can't buy you happiness it may not buy you happiness nothing can right but it gives you access to things that can help you feel happiness or get into the process of acquiring happiness it's a fleeting feeling like any other emotion and i think oftentimes we forget that happiness can also be being able to afford a meal or seek out professional help or have a sitter or go out to a nice dinner once in a while. These are the little luxuries of life that are big things for other people because they cannot acquire or attain them. But let me not go off because these episodes are supposed to be liked. I just like to reach a lot, you know that. So I'm gonna wrap it up here. I can't wait to hear what you guys have to say. Anything I missed, let me know. And until next time, stay safe, stay sane, stay blessed. Love and later.